Welcome back, Believers. This is I Believe with Rick Rambleman. Believers, the new season finds us in a new location. A lonely, ramshackle general store along a country byway with surprisingly a decent amount of traffic. And I have to say that I wonder, as the cars drift by in the darkness, what do their drivers believe? Today, we have a wonderful guest, Alan, who is a paranormal investigator. Um, But before I get to chat with Alan, I do want to follow our tradition and read some viewer, (laughs) viewer, listener emails. And this one comes from Natasha from Alamoochee, New Jersey. They're laughing here in the studio, but Alamuchi is an actual place. It's in New Jersey. It's not too far from where I grew up. Uh, Actually, I went to a Cub Scout Gold Rush Klondike event uh, in Alamuchi, New Jersey, and uh, it was awful. Um, it It was pouring down rain the entire time, and that's not the only reason why it was awful. But, uh... I digress. So Natasha from Alamuchi, New Jersey writes, are there any more episodes or seasons of your podcast or was your show just another flash in the pan lark like everyone else and his brother doing podcasts these days? Um, Natasha, I appreciate your interest in the show and, and seemingly your interest in hearing more episodes and what follows is your answer. Okay, now I'm going to welcome our guest, Alan, uh, our paranormal investigator, and I believe Alan is on line one. Alan, this is Rick. How you doing? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thank you for coming on the program. I'm glad you guys could have me. Yes, yes. Uh, We're very excited to talk to you. I would like you to just tell us what it is you do. I understand you're a, a paranormal investigator. Um, do you accept that title? And if so, what is it that you that you investigate? Um, yeah, actually, um, I'm actually a, an investigator and a researcher. Um, the only thing that I really have investigated is, um, I guess you would call the ghost and haunting side of it. Um, but I'm interested in, you know, the the cryptozoology side, the um, the uh, extraterrestrial side, um, ancient mysteries. Um, pretty much. Uh, interested in all of it but as far as investigating it's, it's only been like the ghost and haunting side okay um how did you get started um you mean as far as the inve- investigation part or you tell me about how you got started as an actual investigator yes okay um so for years i'd, I'd had you know just little things happen and i've always had a, a curiosity for I guess you would say the macabre. So I guess it was just a natural progression of trying to find out uh, exactly what it is that, um, that I've been experiencing over the years. So these were things in your own life that made you question. And then once you questioned, you did, you started researching, correct? Correct. Yes, sir. Now, beyond that, do you investigate, what happens to others? Um, so we have a little bit. Um, so I, I wear many different hats. Um, so I work with my, my own paranormal team, which is apocalyptic paranormal. Um, but I also have a, uh, I work with a bunch of friends. It's called the national paranormal society where I'm, I guess you would tell me there's second or third in line on that one as, as being um, in charge of that. And, we, um, um, and we've and we got right around, I think it's a little over 50,000 people on their, uh, oh. on our Facebook site that we, that we deal with. Yeah. And that is uh, nationwide, worldwide? Um, it's actually international. Um, we've got some reps over in Africa, um, a couple in, South America, and then I've got some friends in Australia that um, that help along with it as well. So now, uh, 
with that, are are you traveling to do these investigations, or is it that that each of these chapters, what have you, are doing their own investigations in their own locations, and then uh, aggregating the info in this one organization? Yeah. So what we do is we have a a, a huge, I guess a a network of of investigators all over the country and some overseas. And and what happens is um, we kind of facilitate getting these people to them, the ones that are having problems. Um, And then we have like some, like if it happens in my area, I'll go check them. And then, you know, let's say if it was in Tennessee, I've got a group of friends there that that can go and do that. So we just actually, um, on the page itself, it's, we talk different things. People will bring, um, you know, photos, videos, things like that for us to take a look at and stuff. But uh, for the most part, we facilitate getting people help wherever they need it. Sure. So the, the next question I was going to ask you was, you know, how do the cases or or clients find you? Are people, I don't want to sound flip, but is it, is it like the Ghostbusters where, you know, they're a little old ladies calling you because there's a noise in her attic? No, actually, there, there, there can be those um, in our area, since I guess um, you guys are based in Lynchburg as, yes. as well, correct? Yeah, so in our area, everything that we're, so far, most of the stuff that we've gotten has just been um, trying to figure out a nice way to say this. Um, it's It's been all in people's heads for the most part. Okay. So... And, and, so a, a and, number and of the cases, me, you know, that's what's, yeah, go ahead. So a number of the cases that you've worked turned out to be something that could be explained as a normal occurrence. Yeah. Okay. C- can you share one that maybe seemed to have some promise of being something juicy, but turned out to be something rather mundane? Um, I can give you a gist of something. Sure. Yeah. Um, we we're having people that were having um, a, a lot of activity sometime around, um, I would say, 1 to 3 o'clock in the middle of the night in the wintertime. Um, and what we ended up finding on that is basically the, the temperature differentials in the house was causing, you know, like the wood and all the cracks so, and pop, um, basically just the house moving. Um, so you, you've got throughout the day, the house is warming up on the outside, you know, and even though you're, you're still heating it on the outside, on the inside, um, as the temperature drops throughout the night, the wood starts, you know, to, to move. And, and that was actually what was causing their, their footsteps and a movement that they were hearing. So you're really looking, uh, you go in there looking to figure out what it is, not necessarily to get the, uh, interesting or sexy story that's going to explode right exactly i i want the truth whether if i find out at the end of this that none of it was real and it was just all in their heads you know i'm okay with that you know i I just i want to find a truth so when you approach a case are you mm-hmm. approaching with skepticism or are you approaching with belief? Um, for the most part, I'm, I'm going to say it's, it starts with skepticism, but you always have to keep in the back of your mind that anything is possible. You know? Sure. Um, and, and you have to leave your belief sets aside and go to it with just a, every case would be a blank slate. Sure. Sure. And, so you're looking, um, sometimes I would assume almost like a home inspector would like looking yeah, through I mean, the house. I, and... I mean, my background, I'm a class A contractor. Ah. I'm also a fire inspector. So you I, know, was, I was about to, a little bit. I was about to ask if, uh, you know, if you ever uncovered anything, Hey, you've got some serious plumbing problems or electrical problems here. Uh, has that ever turned out to be the case that someone, thought they had a haunting and turns out that they had a, a serious problem with their house? No, we, we haven't, but that's uh, one thing that we do see, you know, we, we will point those things out just for, as a safety standpoint. 
So you're coming off doubly as as an a straight shooter and an honest guy because you're not looking to to kind of scoop the sensational story, nor are you looking to make a buck on somebody because they might need some work no. done on their house. Okay, I, I really respect that. Um, in terms of the the process you go through, do you have mm -hmm. like a phase where you where you look at things like a home inspector and then if nothing turns out to be what I would say, quote unquote, normal, then you default to the next step in, in an algorithm. Like, okay, now we break out some kind of sensors or now we look for something that's a little less mundane. Is that how it works? Yeah. Like with us, if there are claims, we'll, um, we send out, um, and it's a, it's an eight page, um, questionnaire. And it's got all kinds of different things on there for them to answer. And in some parts, it's repeating itself, you know, just to kind of, kind of make sure the the story is staying the same. Um, if they get past that, then it goes to a, a home interview where you go and you video it and you talk to the people and um, kind of look around the place itself. And uh, if anything's kind of sketchy as far as you know anything illegal or whatever, and we kind of shy away from that. You know, that's I, I can't. With my my professional job, I can't be in those places, you know. Sure. So, sure. Um, and then after that, it, it goes into an investigation, and a lot of people would like to try to come in one time and say, "Yeah, it's it's haunted or not." But if if people are really having problems and things are going on in their mind, we like to give them, you know, not just one investigation, but quite a few. And there's no standard number of how many. It's just how many it takes for us to to get something or, or to find out what the problem is. You know, it, it could be five, it could be 10, you know, I mean, it, there's no set number. And is this setting up audio equipment or video equipment? Yeah, it, it, it's all of it, audio, video. My thing, I'm, I'm really, I really like the audio side of it because I've gotten a lot better stuff and it's harder to, um, to, to discount on audio to me um, just because it was photography and things like that. Things can, you know, it could be glitches here and there and or different pixels that are screwed up and things that can, can show some things. So I, I really like the audio side. So now is this something that you set up and leave it for a certain amount of time or do you tend to expect to capture that stuff while you're there? Um, sometimes we will leave things. And... Um, we make sure to get, you know, like the, the families like during the interviews. That's one thing that we do is so that we'll have voice of the people that are there as, you know, as something to compare back to, to see if they're actually, you know, if you hear something, it's like, oh, well, no, that was, that was the little girl talking or, or that was, you know, the mom or, you know. And if you do, if you were to leave something, I would assume that there's, that's the tedious side of research. Is it not listening to, the sounds of a house overnight. Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, if you take the one that we did on Sunday, it's, uh, you know, we were only there for what, two, three hours, but at five or six recorders that, that really adds up, you know, on time that you need to listen through everything, much less if you find something, then you have to go through and put it through programs and, and look at the, the actual waveforms of stuff. So that, that takes quite a bit of time. Now, the waveforms, that sounds like you're getting down to a, a deeper technical level. Is And I'm asking because I don't know at all. Uh, is there a right. waveform you're looking for that you point out and say, that's not human or that's not animal, that is, you know, that's paranormal? Is it, is it at that level? No, not yet. I, I honestly wish it, it was that easy you know um you're just looking at so you'll be listening through and you can actually see all the the normal um background noise that you're getting and then you'll see the other that's just right in there that you can see that something's coming through but you know it's not as loud as your background so it's it's somewhere within that spectrum but you're just trying to, to pull that one piece out and and um, isolate it so that you can hear it better so you're still looking at this like I would imagine 
a police detective looks at something. It's not like there are wavelengths for ghosts or wavelengths for, and I'm not trying to sound flip again, uh, there's wavelengths for fairies right, and right. there's wavelengths for UFOs. You're really looking at this just like from a, a, a gritty standpoint of something happened here on this recording. Let's check it out. Right. Yep, okay. Exactly. So there isn't, uh, again, some kind of uh, program that, that weeds out ghosts or, uh, or something that weeds out alien signals. This is purely, let's, we, see, we see the, uh, the visual representation of sound in a waveform, and then we're going to go check that out and listen to it maybe once, twice, three times, four times, five times until we figure out what it is. Right, yeah. And then a lot of times you still end up finding out, oh, well, that was like an HVAC turning on or, or right. something like that. You know, so even though, you know, it's an anomaly, it doesn't mean that it's it is paranormal, you know. So so again, it sounds like you're really looking at this uh, to figure out what is it rather than, hey, let's let's get this great scoop on a haunting or let's turn this into the next Amityville horror. Right, exactly. Fast. That that's what I find is fascinating. Someone who's really doing the detective work here, uh, from from a number of angles. Hey, it could be the house. It could be the people talking. It could be a whole number of other things. Let's let's rule out everything, and then maybe at the end, we're left with something that needs to be investigated even further. Yeah, that, that that's their our motto is rule out all the plausible and what you have left might be paranormal. Okay. And so you're not afraid at the end of the day to say, yep, turned out to be a, you know, house settling or it turned out to be the, uh, the heat pump coming on. No, not at all. You know, see, I find that that's refreshing and it's also fascinating because there are even – scientists who are adhering to the scientific method might uh, approach something with the intent of, you know, I want to just find out the truth, but they want to get published. They want that splashy article to hit the, the scene. And so they uh, maybe look to find some conclusions in the data that aren't aren't there or maybe are a stretch. And so even among the scientific community, you get people trying to find something that maybe isn't there. And yet you're in a community that uh, I'm not saying isn't scientifically grounded, but might be full of people who really want there to be something else out there. And yet you're still approaching it from the fact finding standpoint. Right, and most most of your groups that are actually out there trying to help people, that's what they're doing. They, then you have your ones that are just, you know, your, your blind believers where everything is paranormal, no matter what it is. I mean, you could sit there and watch something happen and be like, oh no, that's not that's not what did it. This was it was such and such, you know, and and it, that really kills it because a lot of them are just trying to get a television show and trying to get notoriety. Sure, you know, and the ones that are doing it just want truth, you know. Now, do you find, uh, I could picture a situation where somebody, and I'm not poking any fun at the elderly, but you might find someone uh, maybe suffering from a little bit of dementia, maybe just purely lonely, and Mm -hmm. they want some of the attention that comes with an investigation, uh, or even just someone to come to their house. Have you encountered something like that? Yeah, um, and and sadly that that does happen. Um, most of the time, if you just talk to them on the phone, that the whole thing comes out. You know, um, just just be somebody that they can talk to. And and a lot of times, I'll tell them, you know, I don't think there's anything that we need to check out. But if you just need to talk, here's my number. Um, and you know, most of them don't use it, but every once in a while, you, you get somebody that does need just somebody to talk to and. And they don't abuse it. it. It's usually just, you know, the calls, hey, I, I was kind of having something again, and I just want to just run it by you, you know. And you can tell that 
you know, they're probably not really having something. They just want somebody to talk to for the day. And that's okay, you know, because still, again, you're helping someone. Sure. Now, do you find that there are people who are approaching not so much a haunting? Like, it's not something that is um, upsetting to them, but maybe they feel the presence of a loved one who is deceased and they want some confirmation that that is indeed the case. Have you ever encountered something like that? Um, I haven't. Um, I've had a, a number of friends that have and talking with them, it, from what I can understand, it, it makes it really hard because it's, it's harder to tell them, you know, that let's say they don't find something and, um, they want them so bad to be there with them. You kind of don't want to break the news to them, you know, that, you know, that doesn't mean that they're not here, but we haven't found anything, you know? Right. Right. Um, from a personal level, you talked mm-hmm. about getting started because there were some things in your own experiences that you couldn't explain. Are there yeah. are there things out there either from your past or in some recent cases that still, pardon the expression, haunt you to this day that right. you can't figure out and it is still something that that either bothers you or intrigues you? Um. Yeah. Um. I, I guess you would say. For, for most of my life, I have seen what people like to call shadow people. Um, really? And I wouldn't say that they haunt me. They just kind of, I don't know, it makes me wonder what exactly it is. Is it a problem with my eyes, which I've gotten tested. The only thing I have is astigmatism. And technically, that doesn't really, you know, explain what I'm seeing. Um, that's one thing. Um, other thing which would probably be more interested for you. Um, we were doing a, uh, for the, the group that I work with, um, an investigation at St. Albans in uh, Radford, Virginia. And um, we were going upstairs to, to set up a, uh, a, it's called a psychomanium chamber. Basically you're placing mirrors in a small location with a flickering light. And um, whether it's brain waves or whatever that's making it happen, you see things in those mirrors. Um, so we were going to set up one of those to pretty much figure it'd be kind of fun for the people to do. And um, so I was walking past this uh, stairway that get, that goes down to where they used to the lecture shop. And um, I had a, a headlamp on and it was kind of to the side. And as I was walking by, it, I saw something out the corner of my eye. So I turned and in the, the dead, dead light of this is the only thing that the best thing, I guess I could describe it as is a, um, it was a human body with a, um, a pig face and, uh, mm. it, it's walking up the steps and it, it looks up and it, it gives me this and I can still see it now. It's like, it looks at me kind of like, um, it's kind of like you can see me that kind of look, you know? And, um, I had my wife and my cousin were behind me probably, I don't know, maybe eight to 10 feet was my wife. And then probably about 10 feet behind her was uh was my cousin and uh right after it looked up and it, it gave me that look it kind of it turned and went into almost like a you've seen the things on cartoons where they go from full standing and then it just zips off you know like it mm-hmm. like this little kind of goes in like a triangular you know path looking thing and it just goes around the corner and um my wife goes did you hear that and i was like yeah and she's like, well, what was it? I was like, nothing. You know, so we, we went on up and they went off to do their thing. And I went upstairs and um, talked to the other people that was with me about what happened. And we actually went back looking for it. And we found it, but uh, it uh, it definitely didn't didn't like us there for some reason or another. Ooh, so explain I keep a little going more about St. Albans all the time for that, you know. So tell me about finding it. What did you find? Um, um, what? So we ended up seeing it one more time, but this time, so it was three of us in a line. And, uh, so the, 
the guy in the middle, he's probably, I want to say 6'5", 280, 290, somewhere in there. And um, the guy that was behind him, I'd say he's 6'1", and maybe probably about the same weight. And we're walking up the stairs, and he turns and sees it, and it, like, pushes him. So it's pushing that guy into the guy in the middle and into me, and it's like they're just shoving us up the steps. Um, go right back down there and nothing. It's like nothing was ever there anymore. So that was something you felt more than saw yes. at that time? Well, they saw it first, but a few seconds later, it was that was the feel. Yeah. Oh. So there, in, in that instance at St. Albans, and hold that thought for a second, St. Albans, uh, there were three people who saw that. Uh, your two... Um, colleagues yeah. and yourself. Okay. Tell mm-hmm. me yes. a little bit uh, for our listeners about St. Albans. That's that's in the region here in Central Virginia, but tell tell our, our listeners a little bit about St. Albans, please. Okay. So St. Albans started off as a boys' school, um, a Lutheran boys' school. Uh, it was pretty rough for the time. Um, one of their accolades was that they, um, they beat Virginia Tech in football. So I guess back then, you know, it was still a thing to, to, to really beat the bigger schools, you know, because they were just this little, little, little Lutheran boys' school. Sure. Um, they they were always fighting, um, things like that. That ended up getting disbanded um, and went up for sale. Uh, Dr. King worked at Western State Hospital in Stanton. Um, due to everything that was going on there, he actually wanted to leave and make his own uh, institution, if you will, that was a lot better um, that treated its patients better than anything in the area. So he bought St. Albans, um, which was St. Albans Boys School then. Um, So he took that, added on to it, made it into a sanitarium, um, and treated patients for quite a while. Um, They did electroshock, hydrotherapy, and insulin therapy. Um, The insulin, uh, sure everybody's heard of the others but the insulin therapy is where they would actually drop your blood sugar down uh really low and then force the sugar back into you just you know uh, with like a dextrose mixture or whatever and it was supposed to shock your body back into to be insane again i guess is you know for a lack of better words for it um and then it actually ended up going into a general practice hospital in the 80s and Ended up, I think the last years was the early 90s that it was used. And when was this this uh, insulin therapy, which I really hadn't never heard of, when was that taking place? Up until the 90s? Um, uh, no, 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 no. That was, uh, I would say, the 50s, 60s era, probably. Sort of that same era of electroshock. Yep. Okay. Mm-hmm. Closes down. Yeah, so it was actually a club med, really, for for psychiatric patients. I mean, because he loved his patients. Um, everybody likes to look at the darker side of stuff, but you know, you kind of look at things now. You know, thirty, forty years from now, we're going to look back and some of the things that we're doing is barbaric. But Absolutely. for their time, that was more humane than what others were doing. So the the idea though was that this was a, a well maintained. Uh, institution and the patients were well taken care of there was a, a true uh, design to to really treat people there yes sir it wasn't mm-hmm. lock them away kind of thing oh no uh, so it doesn't very hands on it, it doesn't patient. have that typical uh, horror movie image of an institution where it is it's kind of a freak show jail this was a a treatment facility, right. uh, seemingly well staffed and 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 done with care. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, you've always got all these people out there that want to that want to twist other stories and make it seem like it was more than than it was, you know. Um, and I don't quite understand that, but you know, whatever. Sure, but it, then it helps them get ratings, you know. Right, but then there is some. There are at least some stories or some unexplained. Uh, phenomena going on, and you've 
research those, correct? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So beyond seeing this this figure and, and being or or some of your colleagues being pushed by this figure, what what brought you there? What was the what were the events, what were the unexplained things that, that brought you there to investigate? Um, the first time we went is because we had just uh we were looking for places to go and didn't realize that they actually allowed people to come in and investigate. So I had contacted Marcel, the owner, and um, she had started doing uh, or allowing paranormal groups come in to to just do investigations overnight, and we decided to go for it. And first time I went there, nothing at all happened. It was just like you were at somebody's house, you know. It was just flat, nothing nothing went on at all. And uh, But I fell in love with the building itself and the people that uh, that ran it, and that kept me coming back. And the more and more you go back there, the more and more things, I guess, I don't know if it, they get used to you or if, um, say other people coming in all the time or bringing stuff with them and leaving it, you know? Hmm. Now is, is the, uh, I'll, I'm going to call it, you know, the, the pig creature. Uh, is that something yeah. that, others have have documented seeing or experiencing or does that seem to be a a, a personal experience uh, between the the three of you i've only heard of the story of one or two others have explained it that way you'll hear some other ones talk about a a goat man or um i can't remember the the other animal but it's always an animal human hybrid and, and, and it makes me wonder that if it's something that uh, presents itself differently all the time, you know. And has have you had any further uh, research of it? Has that caused you to 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 look into? You know, is that something else that's seen in other places, or does it seem to be a a, a Saint Albans thing? Um, the only thing that I could find, I think it was, I want to say Hindu, but I can't remember a hundred percent exactly what religion it was, but, um, it was, it was almost to a T described what it was, but it was some kind of a demon they called it. But to be honest, I didn't get any bad feeling off the thing that I saw. It just, it just startled me, you know? And was that the only thing you experienced at St. Albans or were there other, uh, other events as well that they made you think that something was going on in, in that location? Yeah, we've gotten pretty good EVPs from there. Um, which, you know, electronic voice phenomena. Um, we've gotten, um, seen a whole bunch of different shadow forms there. Um, one of them is actually kind of neat that, a lot of people have seen him. Um, so have you ever seen a horror movie to where the person will get in the floor and move like a spider? Yes. Yes. Kind of like the undulating joints and all. Um, so there's, there's this thing and it's always in this area called the long dark hallway. And, um, it actually bridges between, um, electro shock. And I think it's the up under where, um, the, the boys' school was it's kind of like a long black tunnel in there. And um, it's always seen coming through there. And we've seen that two or three times there. Um, but it, it's just like a, a black spidery mass that, that comes across the floor, goes up the wall and across the ceiling, and then just disappears. And you've seen that multiple times, and multiple people have seen it. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and we'll... Uh, you know, we'll set up different kinds of lights through there and stuff. And um, something's kind of neat. You never see it when there's an IR light through there. Um, and I'm not sure sure why. Um, we've tried photographing it, and it doesn't come up. And I think the if it's a true shadow, when you put light onto it, you shouldn't see it, right? So I, I'm kind of why I'm thinking we're not getting it on camera. Hmm. And, and other people besides your team have experienced that 
creature or mm-hmm. okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's one of the the more seen things there. And and are there St. Albans? This is is open at, at various times for for the general public to come in, or is it uh, selective in the the groups that can go there? No, they do. Um, so throughout the year, um, I think they're going to shut down. I want to say the end of August because they do a haunted attraction, just like a a haunted house type deal from, I want to say the beginning of September to the end of October. And then they'll open back up from November to December for, uh, or if you want to rent the building out for the night. Um, but they also do photograph tours. They do historical tours. And I think they are periodically throughout the year. And I think they're only like 10 bucks to go and do. So if somebody wanted to go out and just, see the location before seeing you know, if they want to spend the money on it they could you know do the ten dollar uh little public investigation thing and they'll do paracons throughout the year um i do one there in may called EnigmaCon, so uh, i know they'll have that one again next year so besides being a place that people can go to do serious research there is there's an <laughs> entertainment element to it and and then yeah. possibly a sort of a, a sh- shared interest social element to it. Um, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what? So they do a con there. So that gets at something I think that from from a skeptical point, people might say, okay, so uh, you're doing this paranormal research, but someone's also running a haunted house in the place, mm-hmm. and yeah. uh, I don't know. A part of me says, "Okay, that that sort of seems like they're they're trying to drum up business for for the Halloween show um, by allowing people to do this at other times." But it also begs the question: Can you have an interest in, say, horror and sci-fi, and and have that be something that's entertaining to you? Can you have that entertainment interest, but also have the scientific interest? Oh yeah, and yeah, is that, does that so. I mean, does that, that describe of, you? That fits me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so you, yeah, I mean, you, I you like ghosts because they're like, entertaining. I do a thing in uh, October at Scarefest, you know, that uh, it's a paranormal, it's a horror conference, is what it is, but they bring in paranormal speakers, you know. So they kind of have mixed the two for that, and the the reason that a lot of your uh, your haunted places do the the um, haunted houses is it's the only way to stay afloat I sure. mean, and to keep the enough money to, to keep the place open. Probably not unlike uh, uh, historical places that might have mm-hmm. plays or historical reenactments at them. They're entertaining people because they've, they've got to keep the, the, maybe the educational uh, components or the uh, preservation components afloat. Yep. Interesting. Okay. Um, in terms of going forward in your investigations, is there a case out there that you're hoping to stumble upon? Um, or one you know of that you're hoping to eventually have the time or resources to investigate yourself? Um. There's one location that I would love to get into, and I don't think there is ever any chance of that happening. Well, there's two locations, but let's put that. Um, the one location is the Central Virginia Training School. Mm. I'd love to do there because that place is actually tied into Western State, where Dr. King came from. Sure. And it also has a very, very dark history if people want to look it up for our listeners that central virginia training center is located right here where we are in lynchburg yes and it's and pretty much in the process the of, of you know <laughs> oh <laughs> this <laughs> sure sure uh you probably have a better chance of uh investigating the training center than you do the white house um 
Oh, yeah. Plus, it's a heck of a lot closer. And I think it's pretty much closed down now or in the process of... Yeah, I think they only have like, what, 50 or 60 people maybe? If that, yeah. So who knows in... uh, in a few years, there there may be ample opportunities to explore it. Yeah, I've, I've tried to get in there, you know, a bunch of times, but there's a lot of people that have snuck in there, and I, we don't do that. We're pretty ethical, you know, and I don't go anywhere. I don't have permission. Well, is, is there something that you've heard about at the training center that has piqued your interest, or is it just a general interest? Yeah, just a general interest because it's, you know, you hear, you know, rumors of the place and and um, then you see the historical significance that it had. I you know that it, it played with a lot of um, things leading up to World War World War Two that um, it's pretty rough. And you figure a lot of those things that could have held there or happened there. It's no telling what that place has held energy wise, you know. So I think it would be interesting just to see if something is there. Well, if you do get a chance, I'd certainly like to hear uh, about it. Um, Of course, you seem to like to do things on the up and up, so there may be a few years before that's an opportunity. But I have to imagine that that's going to be a site that that it's going to be hard for anyone else to use. And so maybe it will become something like a St. Albans where just because the city or the state needs to maintain it, that they'll be open to people coming in. And like you, I think you said uh, the term you used for St. Albans was renting it for the day or the night to do their own experiments mm-hmm. or observations. Yeah. We can only hope, you know. Now, was there something, I understand that you did some, uh, some other research here in Lynchburg at the Academy? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, we did that on um, on Sunday, just a kind of little a mini investigation, I guess you would call it. Um, so, like I said, if we do like a huge one, it takes days and you know and hours, and I don't want to have to put Tabitha through that for to get in there, you know. So, well, the the um, for the for our listeners, the uh, the academy is uh, a newly renovated theater that uh, is rather storied. It uh, closed down in the, I guess, early 60s or late 50s, I believe. And Mm -hmm. when it closed down, it was still segregated. And then uh, it was laying abandoned for for decades. And then just this uh, past December, it was, uh, after many, many years and millions of dollars of renovation, it was it was reopened, uh, and uh, I, I I was there, and to to see uh, uh, Mavis Staples um, perform uh, was an incredible thing for for Lynchburg to to have that be the opening performance and the uh, first uh, integrated or non segregated performance in that theater was was an amazing thing uh, to see and experience. Um, Right. But but that's me digressing about the academy itself. Did you find anything <laughs> of interest while you were while you were investigating? Not yet. We're still still going through everything. I had to work yesterday, so that's twenty four hours. I didn't get to didn't get to listen to to audio. So I but I, so far nothing has really really stood out. I can appreciate though the the grind that that must be of of looking through. You know all that footage and and uh, and audio and trying to see something. Uh, I'm I'm sure is tedious. Oh yeah, but I mean to me that's the fun part, you know, because that that and actually being in a in certain locations is is the neat part. Because um, the actual uh, investigation part, unless things are are really popping and clicking and happen, um, it, it can get fairly boring after a while. Sure. So, like a lot of things uh, that involve research, whether that's archaeology or or history, it, it's combing through lots of data. It's combing through lots of things and can be a real grind. So this is this is not uh, the sexy stuff you see in a movie. Um, it's hard work. No. Yeah. <laughs> 
Oh, definitely. It, it's not what you see on TV because they'll film for, what, 10 or 12 days for 43 minutes of, of footage. You know? Sure. So it's it's a sure. whole lot that, that goes into it. And not to mention on TV, they probably have really 10 minutes of footage that they're stretching out to 40 because it's all, you know, coming up next, coming up next. Right. Um, because, you know, this is, you're seeing small bits of, of what is that, what is that. Um, still very intriguing, but things get hyped up for, for entertainment purposes. Right. But it seems to me like you, um, you avoid the hype and the sensationalism because you have a different approach to this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, because I guess we're in it for totally different reasons, you know? So we, um, a lot of the big flashy equipment that you see, a lot of it, we don't use. Um, we stay to things that we actually know 100% how they are supposed to work. And, and, um, the things that can give false readings and stuff. Um, but we're always testing new pieces of equipment all the time just to see if that is something that we would, you know, want to purchase. Cause it's, it's funny. You can take, um, one little, let's just say it was a cat toy or something. And I uh, say that cat toy was, you know, you could buy it for $2 at the store. Well, somebody will take it, you know, rebrand it and call it some kind of paranormal gizmo and sure. charge up to like, Seventy, eighty dollars for it, you know. So you got to be really wary on the things that that actually work and and what you try to try to use now. I have to imagine, heck, even in uh, in medicine and uh, healthcare, there is a lot of hucksterism out there of you know what this this laser can do for you, or uh, you know, or what this. Uh, this ionic device can do for you. So I have to imagine that also exists in, in the paranormal sphere. Oh yeah. I mean, it's, I would, I would say it's a, it's a multi-million dollar industry. Now, if, if you could get one thing on television and because everybody that sees it on television, they're going to want to buy it, you know? Sure. So they go out there and people spend tons of money on, on things that, you can probably make for eighty dollars yourself. Right. Well, speaking of of the financial side, do you do this as a commercial business? No, I, I never charge for anything. You don't. No, sir. This is because you have a, a true interest in in what you might find, but also a true interest in helping people. Right. I mean, if if they truly need help. The, the least thing that they need is another bill, you know? Sure. Um, I, I don't believe in it. Now, do you think anyone ever has set something up to be found? Not, I mean, obviously that's happened in, you know, at large in the world, but ever in your, your investigations here in Central Virginia that someone created a situation because they wanted you to investigate it and, and blow it up? Um, no, I've heard of, um, locations that charge for, uh, investigations of, um, possibly putting audio through and, and stuff like that. Um, I've heard of that, but as far as somebody, you know, becoming the next amenable, I haven't heard of anything around air area for that. So, so from your experience, you've got, for the most part, people who have legitimate concerns um, and you go in there and, and do a legitimate check for for what it might be. Yes, sir. Okay. Yep. All right. So if if someone were listening to the program and wanted to get in touch with you or your organization, how could they do that? Um. So we used to run a website, and we stopped doing that because it was just it was inundated with. Um, false claims, I guess you would say, which made it hard to to find the uh, the right ones to to go investigate. Um, so you can get in touch with me at uh, on my my phone is the best. It's four three four six six zero zero two four four, and um, 
I'd say that is the number one way to get in touch with us. Can you say that one more time? It's uh, 434-660-0244. And ask for Alan. Yes, sir. Alan, I really appreciate you having on the show, having you on the show. And uh, if you would like to come back at some point when you have some more stories to share, we would absolutely love to have you. I'd love to come back. And if uh, you guys ever want to go again, let me know and uh, we can make it happen. Sounds great. Appreciate your time, Alan. You take care. Yes, sir. Thank you. Well, believers, that concludes this episode of I Believe with Rick Rambleman. As always, we invite your calls at 540-425-0447. Again, 540-425-0447. Or you can email us at rickrambleman at gmail.com.